fellow here at the Short Center. So I have the pleasure of introducing our Shorts Leadership Series speaker today, Leslie Robertson. So Leslie is the Vice President of Software Development and leads the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure User and Developer Experience Engineering Organization. Since her early years at the organization, Leslie drove multiple initiatives to create a cohesive engineering culture. And with her bonafide experience, she's here to address the diversity problem in the tech industry and why the tech industry needs humanities majors. No stranger to that field, Leslie graduated with a double BA in professional writing and creative writing right here from CMU. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Leslie Robertson. Hey everybody, can you guys hear me? Yes, okay. So first of all, thank you all for coming and spending your lunch hour with me. I know you have many exciting places you could be and that you chose to be here and talk about this topic is, is uh, really special, so thank you. Um, I wanna just say how much fun, right off the bat, thank you to Rebecca. It is so much fun to be back at Carnegie Mellon. I haven't been here since 1990, if you can believe. Uh, CMU really shaped my life in so many ways that it's almost impossible to describe. Uh, so it's a really great delight to be back here and be able to report to students in the room that all of your hard work and your sleepless nights are really going to be worth it. <laughs> you guys are going to, you're in for a great future. So um, I want to just kind of find out who's in the room. Can you uh, tell, get, you, or what majors do we have in the room? What? Information system. Yay, okay. I found out about that major yesterday, so. <laughs> have my eye on you guys. <laughs> what else? Uh, made, made some students. Can you raise your hands? Tech innovation manager. Excellent. All right. Science Wonderful. Um, science. Say it again. Science. Okay, cool. Cog okay. Excellent. All right. Okay. So that gives me a smattering. Any humanities majors other than my info systems? Yes? Yay. Okay. Yay, my people. Okay. Cool, so um, uh, one word of warning. If you are here to learn from a founder, that is not this talk. I have never founded a startup. I'm the person you call right after you found your startup to help you grapple with all of that nothingness that comes after the initial pitch uh, and turn it into something. So that's my happy place. Um, and I'm going to tell you some things I've learned along the way that I hope will help you as you begin your professional journeys and you become founders. Um, this is ostensibly a talk about building diverse teams, and I'm absolutely going to hit on that. But um, I, I want to just sort of begin with some sort of professional uh, advice to the, the students in the room. Um, I will begin by saying that I have six brothers and no sisters, so this is a ratio that prepared me very well for my career in technology. Uh, the only benefit of that imbalance is that when I go to tech conferences, I usually have the ladies' room completely to myself. So, <laughs> one benefit, but that's not for long, I hope. <laughs> so, um, question, uh, what was your first computer? Yeah, yes, yes, you. What was your first computer? An Apple Mac what? Okay. Okay, yep, all right, all right, Got, gotcha. How about you? Yeah. Okay, all right, all right, cool. You, just the first one you laid hands on and went, ooh, this is cool. How can I play with it? Yeah, okay, cool. How about one of the younger people in the room? How about you, uh, information systems major? What was your first computer you laid hands on? Um, yeah. Was it a desktop? Was it portable? Or Okay, it was a desktop. Okay, so not a laptop. All right, so. Here's a picture of me as a freshman in my dorm room in Moorwood Gardens holding my first computer. This was actually not really my first computer. My first computer was a Commodore or something or other that saved its data on a, on a cassette tape, if you can believe. And this computer was really only good for one thing and that was playing Pong. And so I played a great deal of Pong. I don't know how many of you in the room uh, know about Pong. But anyway, my plan, this is a 512K Mac. 
Um, this is, uh, does not have a hard drive. The entire operating system was on a floppy disk this big, and if you lost that, you were screwed. So uh, my plan for this um, computer was to become the next Pulitzer Prize winning long form literary journalist. I wanted to be the next John McPhee. Um, but it didn't end up happening. Instead, a very different thing happened to me, and it is a magical thing that every parent and every professor here at Carnegie Mellon hopes for. I came to college and I actually learned something. At the time I attended CMU, I, every single student here, regardless of major, had to buy a personal computer, which was not a requirement at any other university at the time, uh, and we all had to take programming classes. Is this still the case? Does everyone have to still take some degree of programming? Okay, yes, all right. So I resented this requirement from the bottom of my soul. I, this was an affront to my artistry. I couldn't believe I was being required to do this. Wine, 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 wine. Anyway, I trudged to class and I did my programming assignments and it was Pascal at the time, so I'm, you know, way back in the day. Uh, and gradually, it began to dawn on me that a well-crafted piece of code has a great deal in common with a well-crafted piece of writing. Both of them, uh, th these activities are not in conflict with each other, rather they're very kind of perfect complements. And both require clear, organized thinking, right? You can't, you know, meander all over the place. Both require logic, a logical argument, some creativity, a hunger to tackle old problems in new ways, uh, both have the capacity to influence society, right, for good or for ill, and the capacity to change the world. So, thank you for forcing me to do that, Carnegie Mellon, because I guarantee I never, ever would have gotten there on my own, and it really did change the course of my life. So, where did all of this lead? So I work studied in the engineering and science library over in Wien Hall, and I also worked in the academic advisory center in Baker Hall. And after graduation, I got my very first uh, job as a technical writer at Oracle. Um, I stayed at Oracle for two years that first time, this was a long time ago, and I worked on a graphical front end to a very early version of the Oracle RDBMS, back when the idea of a relational database was kind of a new thing. It's, taken off now, but <laughs> at the time, not a given. Um, most importantly, I met the love of my life at Oracle. He's in the back there. Uh, and I've been now married to that same wonderful and extremely patient man for 27 years. We have two daughters, uh, neither of whom have followed their mother into the glamorous world of tech. Uh, one is a writer who works in feature film production. The other is a theatrical costume designer. But I digress. Putting all of our financial eggs in the same basket at Oracle felt kind of risky at the time. So when a recruiter called me to bring me to a startup, I went ahead and made that leap. That seemed kind of interesting, a little bit scary. Again, I learned something. I learned that I am fundamentally a startup person at heart. I am the happiest, the most satisfied, the most engaged at work when I'm creating something from absolutely nothing. Uh, so I've worked predominantly on version 1.0 things throughout my career. Uh, I've done the startup through acquisition by large corporation three times now, and I'm pretty well acquainted with environments of all sizes and levels of maturity. And they each have their joys and their sorrows and their benefits and their drawbacks. Uh, and while I have never founded a startup, as I mentioned at the beginning, I am the person you call right after you found your startup because I love the blank space. I love wearing many hats. I love not staying in my lane. I love the opportunity to spin something up where before there was nothing. This is not always possible in a well-established corporate environment. But I love beginnings, and so I keep going back to the startup. I also spent a decade, uh, this is kind of for some of the women in the room, I spent a decade freelancing as a technical writer when my kids were little because it meant that, I, uh, that exciting version one work. It was pretty lucrative, and it allowed me to control my time so that I could be the kind of parent that I wanted to be. My second uh, child was born a mere seven hours after I had finished a book and sent it to a publisher, so it gave me a great deal of flexibility, uh, which you know is important in you know your early years. So 
I want to begin this whole thing by giving you guys some sort of professional tips because um, I look out in the room and I've talked to my, my uh, brethren in the English department yesterday and there's a lot of questions and a lot of fear. And uh, I just want to tell you some, some things. This is, uh, this is hopefully going to help. Um, tip number one, figure out who you are and be that. It's quite simple. I encourage you to spend the time to figure out what you actually care about and enjoy, not what someone tells you you should care about and enjoy. Uh, and follow those impulses. They might lead you on a path that meanders a bit or that doesn't look like anyone else's path, but that is okay. You will be authentically yourself as you walk it and you will be so much happier. So pay, how do you find that you pay attention to the places where you're so immersed that you lose track of time. That's a real good indicator that you're doing something that really lights you on fire. And I also encourage you to take all of those tests that I'm sure you can go to the Career Center and take um, to see what themes emerge, to really figure out your strengths and play to those. Investing in your weakness will make you incrementally better at those. Investing in your strengths will make you soar. I'm a strong, strong believer in strength, investing in your in, in, in your sweet spot. Um, I'm kind of a quiz nerd. Who's taking the Myers-Briggs test? Okay, what, what's your type? Me too, oh, we're the best ones. Okay, uh, what, <laughs> who else, who else is taking it? Is, are there any E's in the room? E, okay, so, it, so those who haven't taken, I, I encourage you to take it. It's a, it's a very um, nuanced and interesting uh, look, but there's many, many other uh, interesting tests you can take, like um, the color personality one. This one's very popular at Microsoft. Anybody know their color personality? What's your color? White. Okay, wh white. Okay, so I'm a red. I'm the be brief, be bright, be gone person, right? So um, in the thinking, the four square thinking profiles, which is a problem solving tool, uh, I'm a driver. So um, anyway, you get the idea. Figure out yourself, figure yourself out and really play to your strengths. These kinds of t tests are also really very helpful in creating diverse teams and I'll talk more about that in a minute. So I pivoted into leadership after my kids were a little more grown because I had a really particular goal in mind. Uh, after working in a lot of different environments, big and small, and uh, under a lot of different kind of leaders, I really wanted to create the kind of environment in which I personally wanted to spend my very precious time. We don't get a lot of it on planet Earth, and I wanted to make it count. So, uh, you know the saying, and if you don't, you entrepreneurs in the room, you should. Unless you're the lead dog, the view never changes. So. How did I end up at Oracle again? This is a weird place for a person who loves startups. And so in 2013, I was again recruited to join a startup. This one was called Nebula. Uh, it was founded by a bunch of very brilliant uh, engineers from NASA who were making an OpenStack-based private cloud appliance. OpenStack was, of course, developed at NASA. Uh, so for the next two years, I was again in my happy place, version one, starting something from nothing, working with this really great engineering team, swinging multiple bats, and growing every day. However, on April 1st, 2015, our startup died. And this leads me to tips, the next tips, tips number two and number three, or three and four, I think, I think I've messed up my numbers here. Anyway, the next tip is, Bringing hardware to market requires much more runway than you think. <laughs> and don't shut your startup down on April Fool's Day because everybody thinks you're kidding. Terrible idea. So for the first time in my entire adult life, I suddenly found myself unemployed. We packed up our cardboard boxes. We did the walk of shame down Castro Street in Mountain View and we wept into our beers and it was a very, very, very dark day. But meantime, in the back of my mind, I'm screaming, I need a job. I'm the source of my family's health insurance. By this time, my husband was also freelancing. So for the next few days, uh, it was just a blur of talking to headhunters and arranging interviews and boning up for those interviews so I didn't sound like an idiot. And uh, I will just say right up front, I drove myself and everyone else in my family crazy for those seven days. Anyway, luckily, a little bit after this, our CEO at Nebula called the engineering team back into the office because there was someone who wanted to meet us. 
And waiting for us when we got there were several executives from Oracle, people you've heard of, who pitched an engineering talent acquisition and the purchase of our IP, which of course they promptly shelved, which is not atypical. Sometimes companies buy other companies simply to put them out of play. Uh, one thing led to another, and I suddenly found myself with an offer to go back to Oracle after more than 20 years. So this was a full circle moment. I really wasn't sure how I felt about this, but it meant that I would get to keep working with my Nebula colleagues and it solved the immediate health insurance crisis, so I went ahead and went for it. As it turns out, I had accidentally landed on the doorstep of the mother of all version ones. I went to work for a small, approximately 50 person team in Seattle that was focused on building Oracle's very nascent generation two bare metal infrastructure cloud. We were really just a science experiment at this point, uh, not even in limited availability yet. We were really just an idea. Uh, but there were a lot of really, there's a lot of really interesting work to do and a lot of very smart and committed and fun people to do it with. And so through absolute sheer chance, I had landed back in my happy place, which leads me to tip number whatever this is. Raise your hand. Raise it often. Notice what needs to be done, even if it's boring or it's outside your wheelhouse and volunteer to do it. You will learn, you will grow, and most importantly, you will acquire a reputation for getting things done and being able to execute. In a startup environment where there is always too much to do and not enough people to do it, there are ample opportunities to raise your hand, truly. In my first few months at OCI, I had no team. I had come on my own. So I recruited and hired my first few key people because of course then they could go and recruit and hire other key people, it's a force multiplier. Uh, and I also spun up a whole bunch of other stuff that had nothing to do with my actual charter, the thing that I'd been brought there to do, but that helped the business by solving very real problems that people were having. So one example, New hires in OCI, and this is not atypical in large corporate environments, new hires were sort of left to flail in a very self-service culture. Uh, it could take people a month or more to just get productive enough to commit their first line of code. Um, so by gathering volunteers and booting up weekly onboarding and engineering camps that led these newbies through the types of basic things that people typically found you know, to be time sucks and somewhat challenging, we were able to shave that time to contribution down to just a few days. It was not something I had ever done before, and, but it was something that ended up making a really big difference for OCI, and here is why. In the four years that I've been with OCI, we have grown from that initial 50-person team to a team of over 5,000 people. I will let that sink in. That is more than 1,000 people we've added to our organization in a year. That's a lot of onboarding and an exponentially big impact, and it made a huge difference to our business. So in four years, we've gone from being a science experiment, a, an idea that might be something, to becoming the centerpiece of and the platform for Oracle's multi-billion dollar business. All parts of it are now OCI-centric. We landed on the Gartner Magic Quadrant for Infrastructure Cloud after only two years. And in that time, we went from three or four basic cloud services one, running in one little region to over 60 services running in regions across the world with more on the way. I went personally from running a three-person team of technical writers to running a multi-million dollar, 350-person engineering organization. It has been a ride. So that's where we were in 2016, one region. That's where we were a year later. That's where we were a little after that. That's September, and by the end of 2020, we will be in 36 reasons, regions. I can personally say from my heart that raising your hand will take you out of your comfort zone. That kind of scale means that you have to take on more than you actually feel ready for. You have to do it much more quickly than feels comfortable, and you will not do it all perfectly. Take it from a recovering perfectionist. You will experience some fear. You will miss the mark sometimes. But tip number five is, Number six, do it anyway. Do the new hard thing with an open mind, an open heart, and a willingness to take feedback and iterate. It is okay to be scared. Guess what? 
everyone is scared. It is not okay to let those fears and uncertainties hold you back. Seize those opportunities even when you don't feel ready because that is what's going to lead you to the next big thing. My next tip is to always seek feedback. Don't ever be afraid of feedback. It is really the golden ticket to getting things done. You can guess or you can ask. It turns out that life actually is an open book test, you guys. It's, it's not a secret. Uh, the people on my team know that I take feedback very, very seriously. I give a lot of it and I ask for a lot of it. This might sound scary, but I have found this practice to be the golden key to understanding what I need to do to be the most effective. However, while you're getting all of this useful input, and let's be honest, not so useful input sometimes from other people, it is very important to keep in touch with yourselves too, which leads me to tip number eight. Write yourself a note, seriously. Take the time to articulate what you truly value, what winning looks like on a deeply personal level. I am not talking so much about what you do or what you deliver, that not what your product is, as much as what you want that experience of bringing that to market to feel inside of you. This is easy to do on easy days and very hard to do on hard days. So do it on an easy day, write it down, file it away, and on a hard day, you can pull it out and remind yourself, you will be very, very glad you did this. So user experience teams like mine often create tenets, right? Who's heard of a, who's heard of a tenet, right? To guide decision making and avoid, avoid reinventing the wheel over and over and over. This note will function as a personal tenet for you. Uh, it will help you with your decision making, with keeping you pointed at your true north. And believe me, there will be many distractions that will steer you away from that. It will help to refill your emotional well and it will strengthen your resolve to push through the tough stuff to the place that you actually want to be. So as I said, I became a leader because I want to create the kinds of positive, diverse, growth-oriented environments in which I personally want to spend my precious time. So when I need to choose between several different courses of action, I ask myself, what next step will get me closer to or possibly further away from that ideal? And boom, you experience instant clarity. So take that, take that time and write your note uh, that describes what you value and what good looks like to you and it, revisit it often. So I'm going to tell you mine. I will model this for you. Here's mine. This is what good looks like to me. I value collaboration and helping each other. Occasional heroics are fine. In startup environments, heroics are frequently required. But if we need to do that over and over and over in the same ways, we are absolutely doing it wrong. Uh, I value reliability, people who follow through on their commitments and who do what they say they will do, whether it is something big or something small. Uh, I want to work with those people and they are rarer than you might imagine. Be one of them. I value people who talk to each other, not about each other. I value being surrounded by people who tell me the truth, even the really hard truths. Uh, I value a sense of humor, being able to laugh together and sometimes at ourselves. This was a sign I saw in front of a hair salon and I thought it was a great example of humor in, in a, what was possibly a tough moment for these folks. Uh, and finally, I value kindness. As one of my brilliant mentors, Patty Azzarello, says, be tough on results but kind to people. And there is, in fact, a way to do both. Now we arrive at the at the topic that this talk was actually meant to cover, which is creating diverse teams and what in heck do the humanities have to do with tech companies. So tip number nine is to check your blind spots. We all have them. The word diversity is often used in corporate settings to mean gender diversity or ethnic diversity, but I actually mean it in a much more expansive sense. I mean it to also include diversity of disciplines, of problem solving styles, of interpersonal styles, of education, of perspectives. There's been a lot of really interesting research lately about how extremists are created, and especially of the ways in which online culture can sometimes take people further and further into an echo chamber that suppresses any opposing points of view. Often this descent down the rabbit hole is driven by algorithms that gradually just stop bringing up any alternative points of view. And these algorithms are having some, I think any, you know, everyone here would agree, having some unintended and, and somewhat toxic effects on our, on our culture and on our discourse. So 
these algorithms are helping create blind spots. And in business, in the business context, blind spots represent risk to your business. Tech companies can inadvertently fall into the same traps. They sometimes fall into the trap of hiring only people like themselves or only people from certain schools or only people with a certain problem solving style or point of view. Many companies rely heavily on referrals, right? Hey, bring your friend here and you'll get $2,000 or whatever you know, your referral bonus of choice is. Sometimes, but the, but the problem with this is this sometimes results in very homogeneous teams as we bring in a whole bunch of people who are exactly like us. So the first step in building diverse teams, in my experience, is stepping back and noticing what the heck is going on and then consciously making space for something broader and something better. This requires a little bit of bravery. It requires some stepping away from sort of groupthink and accepted wisdom and looking at things with a more inclusive eye. So if your team is only composed of people who are similar to you or God forbid only people that you like, uh, then your team is like a table with all of its legs in one corner. It's not a good table. So how do you check your blind spots? One, there's actually no secret sauce, but I'm gonna give you a couple ways. Uh, one really easy way is every time you walk into a room at work, make a casual private survey of every single room you go into at work. How many people are in the room with a gender identity that is different than yours? How many people of color are in that room? How many people are from a different educational discipline than yours? How many people are of a different nationality than yours? How many people have a different sexual orientation than yours? How many people with a different educational background or a different major than yours? How many introverts? How many extroverts? How many people with different physical capabilities? There's a lot, lot more questions you can ask, but those are the ones I look for when I enter a room. Uh, and cultivating a diverse team takes really conscious work and there really is no magic formula. The key is to keep on checking those blind spots. Actively seek alternative points of view. Seek things that challenge you. Ask yourselves, if you're coming up with a business plan or a product proposal, ask yourselves, what is it about this current plan that's likely to be controversial? Who isn't going to like this plan or understand this plan and why? Who isn't going to be able to use this product and why? Who does this product serve? Who does this product leave behind? Who might this product hurt? You also wanna make sure that your interview process isn't biased, that your loops are constructed in such a way that you aren't reinforcing that homogeneous status quo. And please do not make the rookie mistake of asking the outlier to solve the problem. That's like asking the fish to solve the water pollution. It doesn't work. Make this everyone's problem. That is the only way you actually move the ball forward. You wanna gather people around you who are smart in different ways than you are, and you always wanna hire people who are actually smarter than you. I was at an executive leadership offsite a few years back at a company that will remain nameless, and we all took the same test. In that case, it was the Clifton Strengths Finder, and we plotted our result, group results on a graph. All of us put our plots on the same chart. Every single person in that team maxed out on the achievement and the execution scales. We were go-getter. We knew how to get shit done. But we all got near zeros in empathy and interpersonal scales. We look like a bunch of sociopaths on that graph. That is not a diverse team. That is a team with blind spots, and that creates risk for your business. So, my humanities majors in the room, what if you are the diverse one at your tech company? What if you are the one who is different that, than everyone else? How do you navigate that? That can be a hard position to be in. You do that by being brave and by being able to really articulate and own your unique advantages. I call this owning your free square or playing your free square. Who has played bingo? What's in the middle of the bingo card, right? It's one you get for free, right? It is something that to you feels so easy and so obvious that you don't even realize it might have value to other people who have different free squares. So what I'm really challenging you to do is find your free square. 
When you own your differences or your free square, you are also, in fact, welcoming other people's differences. So again, I'm gonna model this for you, what this looks like for me, what I've learned on my career. So I'm a quite a bit older than most of my colleagues. I'm definitely more female than most of my colleagues. I am absolutely abysmal at math. I'm an English major in charge of a large engineering organization, and what that means is that in a technical gunfight, I am armed with a banana. I don't win technical fights, but the secret is that banana can actually be weaponized. I'm good at telling a story, I'm good at making a case, I'm good at clarifying, summarizing, and driving tangible action, bringing things across the finish line. I'm really good at identifying talent and mentoring it and helping it grow. Uh, I'm good at turning dreams into actionable plans and then driving those plans to actual things in the world. I am a TCK. Are there any TCKs in the room? Yay, all right. So, so a TCK, for those not lucky enough to be one, uh, stands for third culture child. Uh, or third culture kid, rather, because that's what the K is for. So a TCK is someone who, as a child, spent a significant amount of time in one or more cultures other than their own or their parents' culture. And what happens is they then integrate those cultures, their birth culture, into a unique third culture. I'm a TCK because I grew up in the former Panama Canal Zone, and the first time I came to, lived in the United States was when I came to Carnegie Mellon at age 18. I felt like a fish out of water. I was so out of step with my peers. I was so lonely, so homesick, and so freaking cold. At the time I was here, uh, a, a long distance phone call to my people back in Panama was $2 a minute, so you only called if you were bleeding. Uh, it was a dark time, and the internet wasn't a thing yet, so it wasn't like, you know, email or chat or text or anything, you can't, it was, you were just away, you were gone. So, as a cohort, we TCKs have been studied quite a lot, and it turns out that there are both some challenges, but also some enormous benefits to being a TCK. So, some of the challenges, we sometimes have a really painful awareness of reality. We can have difficulty adjusting to cultures where the only culture that is discussed or focused on is itself. I know a lot of tech companies that fall into this trap, and that pretty much describes the experience of being a humanities student at a school like this where tech is king. So uh, that can be a bit of a painful, disorienting uh, experience. We also often lack experience about our home culture. Um, I remember feeling, and, and again, it, this is less of a problem now with the internet and you can stream anything and buy anything and you know whatnot, but back in the day, this was a, a problem. Uh, I remember feeling really profoundly out of step with my peers freshman year because I didn't understand any of their television-based cultural references because I had never seen most of those shows. Uh, and I had a really strong tendency to overbuy things because I had come from a, a culture with some scarcity or an economy with some scarcity. So I would go to the, grocery, the drugstore and buy 10 tubes of toothpaste at a time, which was weirded my roommate out a little more than a little. But it was uh, a Carnegie Mellon, uh, a writing professor here at Carnegie Mellon, a guy named John Ackerman, who helped me to see that my differences the very perspective that made me feel so lonely and so out of step with my peers was actually kind of a superpower. On the plus side of being a TCK, TCKs tend to have an expanded worldview. We understand that there is more than one way to look at a situation. We also tend to have fairly high levels of interpersonal sensitivity because of our increased exposure to a variety of perspectives and lifestyles we sort of learn early to monitor our emotions and then register sort of societal norms and cues a little more readily. We tend to have a very high level of cross-cultural competence or cultural intelligence. That is, we are able to function effectively across national, ethnic, and different organizational cultures. I think this is why I've been successful in both startups and large corporations, because you change how you move through the world depending on environment. TCKs tend to recognize each other. 
My husband is also a TCK. I have a few TCKs working for me, and I am still friends with other TCKs that I met in kindergarten. That is that third culture at work, that weird, empowering difference that we all share. So, my humanities majors, own your glorious difference. Play your free square. Most people think tech, and they think developers, but there are so many roles in tech that are essential to tech besides writing code. Product management, technical writing, design, user experience research, release management, you don't, know how to, you don't need to know how to code to do any of those jobs. Not only that, the skills that you learn in a humanities degree are really, really important for those jobs. For example, one of the most compelling things that we, in the humanities, is our curiosity about the human condition. And you cannot build good technology if you don't have empathy for your users. Another important skill is big picture, big picture perspective. Developers are well-trained and very good at drilling down and solving very specific, narrowly focused problems. That's all great. Humanities majors, on the other hand, are trained to see cause and effect at a very broad level. We learn how to connect the dots across widely disparate topics. You can't build good tech unless you're thinking about that big picture. Some tech companies build products that are for developers, but most tech companies don't. They build products for teachers, for lawyers, for factory workers, for doctors, for retirees, for children, for humans, for Fortune 500 companies, for small businesses, for people. At its core, our industry is trying to solve all the myriad problems that are faced by billions of people. If we want products that can anticipate and serve the needs of a really diverse set of humanity and that don't hurt the very people we're trying to help, then we need people in tech who come from all kinds of backgrounds and who reflect the full diversity of thought and human experience. We need the humanities. My team, my team that I manage now, has a great deal of educational diversity. We've got people from Stanford, we've got people from Harvard, we've got people that don't have, didn't go to college at all. We've got everything from me, who holds a bachelor's degree, through you know, people who've got PhDs in computer science, some of them multiples. We have discipline diversity. We have engineers, we have writers, we have product managers, technical program managers, those guys are gold because they're really hard to find, good ones. Um, designers, user experience researchers, I've got a really kick-ass admin without whom this tech situation would absolutely not work. It is not about overcoming deficiencies. You are not less than, but rather it is about your potential to add unique value in situations that are inherently prone to diverse thinking simply by virtue of the population at your average tech company being overwhelmingly male and technical. But this takes courage. It takes owning your differences. It takes playing that free square and being able to describe it to someone. It takes being unafraid to stand out. And in my experience though, bravery is contagious. You do it, you empower other people to do it too. Last tip, ask questions. You guys are students, I hope you do this every day. But my years as a technical writer really drilled this into me. In those situations, I was inevitably the least technical, least informed person in the room, and so asking questions was my lifeline to understanding requirements and delivering solid work. But as any tech writer worth her salt will tell you, relentless keystroke testing and asking a lot of follow-up questions often results in answers like, gosh, I don't know, or gee, we didn't notice that gap, or yeah, I guess it wasn't as obvious as we thought. So I quickly learned that by being unafraid to look stupid and asking lots of questions, I was actually able to drive better outcome for the users that I was there to serve. So pro tip, when someone is unwilling to entertain your questions, assuming you've done your appropriate homework, don't just go in there and be like, oh, explain everything to me, do your homework. If someone still won't answer your questions, that says a whole lot more about them than it does about you. Gatekeeping is absolutely a thing, but it's a game that only small people play. So humanities people, keep in mind that there is a strong motivation in deeply technical cultures to, to keep that sacred, to, to gatekeep. 
this can be dangerous. It's how the circumstances, for example, that led to the crash of the housing market were kept hidden until it was too late. It's how some algorithms that even today are ruining people's lives are kept hidden and somewhat unassailable. So ask questions. Bring the broader knowledge that you have and only you have of literature, of ethics, of philosophy, of history. All of those incredible sources of cautionary tales that we need to not forget as a species. Bring all of that to the conversation. Storm those gates. There will be days, guys, when you feel like an imposter. That's fine. That is absolutely normal. Everybody feels that way sometimes. That is actually part of, generally speaking, what being an adult feels like. But you cannot let it discourage you. It's a little bit like going to school. It's a little bit like coming to Carnegie Mellon. You were lost, and you were clueless, and you didn't know anything on the first day. And four years later, they are giving you a degree and sending you off into the world. And the same thing happens when you're a humanities kid at a tech company. You'll learn some technical stuff, enough to sort of establish your legitimacy with the more technical folks. But you'll also teach the technical folks some things that they didn't know, things that you're the expert in. The key is to find those areas where you can be the expert and establish your legitimacy on those terms. So don't be afraid to ask questions, even if you think it might come across as a dumb question. Every single person in this room is really, really smart. You would not be here if you weren't. If you're in a group setting and you're wondering about something, I guarantee there are other people in the room wondering about that too. I get thanked all the time for being brave enough to raise my hand and ask questions in big meetings. Every single person is afraid of looking stupid in public. We're, we're trained to stay with the herd and not stick out, right? But what will be remembered when you ask questions is the clarity you drove, the, the, the light you shined on something, not the fact that you didn't know something or catch it the first time. So with that, I will stop and take your questions. What you got? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, no, because yeah, yeah, you can definitely oversubscribe yourself. So the key, the key takeaway there, you, you know, you say yes to the opportunities, but deliver, right? The, the important thing is to, is, again, I'm going to quote Patty Azzarello because she's brilliant and you should read her books, but uh, get famous for getting things done. So yeah, if you're oversubscribed and you've said too much, you've taken on too much, call a stop to that. If you are presented with the opportunity to do something and you really have absolutely no idea how to make it happen or you know what's involved, maybe say no there too or do it with a friend, someone who has that skill, right? Who who can help you navigate that conversation. So yeah, I I take that with a grain of salt. You want to raise your hand, you want to say yes, but you don't want to screw yourself by overcommitting or 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 not being able to bring it across the finish line. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yes. What would you recommend to someone who is in a situation that uh, a very technical person finds themselves at a big tech company surrounded by only very technical people? Yep. Very uh, homogenous environment. Um, what would you recommend to them from a humanities perspective to diversify their thought process so that they, they don't become stalemate? They like it's yeah. Yeah. So a couple of things, um, and I, you know, I'm speaking from the trenches here because we're not we're we're not where we need to be yet in terms of you know our my my team is quite diverse, but partly because of our surface area, but. Um, but we're not where we need to be uh, with that kind of across OCI as a whole. And we're very committed to getting there and, you know, doing things all the time. Um, one of the, you know, one of the key ways is to make sure that your interview process is inclusive, right? Now, um, 
that is uh, that can be a little bit of a challenge when you simply don't have enough of the different people <laughs> so that they can be on every single loop. For example, we you know were figuring out that um, that uh, sometimes female candidates came in and they were having a really different experience than the male candidates were having. That one that wasn't always you know what we would wish it to be. And so our big bright idea was well we'll make sure that every loop has a couple of females on it. Easier said than done when you don't have that many to start with, right? So, so sometimes you have to take a baby step and, and, and grow from there. I, I don't know if what you're asking is actually bringing in certain types of roles or, or, or the, can you clarify, like what specifically are you? Yeah. Sure. Uh, got it. Okay. So somewhere in your company, somewhere it, you know, is going to be that that trove of people. They may be in marketing. They may be in user experience research. They may be designers. They may be a, a product manager. If, you know, take, if you have an idea, for example, that you're wondering if it's going to fly, you could take it to one of those people and say, "Does that make sense to you?" Is there anything I'm missing? Does this scare you? Like what, you know, what, what is, uh, what's going, you know, you can, you can color outside the lines. You can go cr across organizational boundaries to find the kind of input you need. So you Off really go yeah, absolutely. Because honestly, you're encouraged to stay, you know, to status, status quo is kind of its own um, magnet, right? It's just, it tends to attract itself. Uh, and in order to, you know, to check those blind spots, like I was talking about, you have to really actively go hunting for that input. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I have some questions. Yeah. Just, uh, briefly about what you just talked about. Yeah. Like, focusing on um, smaller companies who may not have the resources in order to like have like this sort of multidisciplinary. Uh, sure. Approach, yeah. Like, um, looking for a diverse pool. Yep. Especially when they're really focused on getting their bottom line a lot of the time. Right. Indeed. So like, what would you recommend for like, looking at these like, startup companies that want to have this campus on their hands? So even startup companies are going, I mean, I, I'm not talking about that incubator phase necessarily, but the next phase out maybe when there's uh, 20 people, 30, you know, that even those uh, companies have the kinds of roles I talked about that are sort of developer adjacent, right? Where you don't actually need to be a mad coder in order to add value. Uh, so I would, you know, don't go willy-nilly, okay? Go back to what you care what do you care about? Like software, there's software for everything. Find an area that you care about and then go find the companies that are serving software to that area. That's how I would recommend starting. And and what that's going to allow you to do is when you are, you know, looking for a job and interviewing and so forth, you're going to be able to speak from a place of very deep authenticity and, and, and a place where the value you're bringing is clear in your mind and you're going to be able to make it clear to them. So I, I would start with your passion and, and sort of work out from there. But there are tons of jobs in tech, many, many jobs, big companies, small companies, where coding is actually not needed. Yeah, does that, so you said you had yeah, two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to go off of what you just said. Yep. But yeah, my question, um, my first question is talked about, you talked a little bit about scalability. Yeah. About like when you have like working on projects and you want to grow it like more capacity. It's often like you get into this like field of like, if I don't know, no one else will. Like how do you like, like go into like, like it's almost like a sort of influencer to do or like lead the roles, like whether it's action or not. Yeah. about like assigning tasks. Right. Right, that's called leadership. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely, that, you just described the leadership thing completely, right? I cannot do everything. I can't, I don't know everything. Uh, and I have my own, you know, limited perspective, and that's all I have, right? So if I'm a smart leader, I go around finding people who are smarter than me in way, you're smart, smart in ways that I'm not smart. Put it that way, you know, smart in, that fill my gaps. That's why, uh, you know, I was talking about understanding yourself and what your skills are. So here, so one of the, one of the uh, test tools I talked about was this thing called the, um, the thinking profile. And what it really has to do with is um, how you solve problems, right? Uh, and what I, um, there, there's, and there's four, I'm going to do this from memory so it's going to be wrong, but I, I, there are four um, axes, right? And they combine to make 
the different types. So I am uh, the type that is called the driver, right? So that means I'm, high, I'm a high ideator. I have a lot of ideas, and I'm also a high executor, which means I get shit done. However, um, I am not a detail person. I am very poor at thinking about contingencies. Uh, and so when I'm forming a team, I know I need people who will challenge me in those ways because those are my weak spots. Now, there are people who are, they're, they're like, they don't ha ever have a, an original idea. Uh, they're, you know, maybe a little lower energy than I am, but you hand them something and they will get it done. They will form the plan and they will hit the dates and they will drive, to, you know, and that's a kind of value, right? Because that's not, again, that might not be where your, you know, your skill set is. So being able to really um, articulate what you're good at is gonna go a long way in, in interview situations in particular in helping you, helping them understand what you can do for them. And that's kind of, you know, the big, I don't know how many, how many of you guys have actually gone on a job interview before? Okay, so you know it's a little different than, than in a, it, so when you apply to college, right, you write your college essay and it's all about this is what I did and what I feel and what I'm dreaming about and what I hope to accomplish and da da, da. It's not so much about what you are gonna do for Carnegie Mellon as what Carnegie Mellon is, you know, would do for you if you were allowed to come in. Okay, forget all that when you go out on a job interview. On a job interview, it's all about what can I do to help you solve your problems. So do your homework, know what the company is, know the stage of the company, what kind of ch challenges are they likely facing, who are their competitors, who's maybe doing the thing a little bit better than they are, uh, where might there be gaps, what kinds of jobs are they you know, inter interviewing for a lot of. Maybe they have a gap in a certain area. Really kind of do your homework. If you can call someone up and take them out for coffee and just kind of get a brain dump of what's going on at this company. Go on Glassdoor, read, just do your homework. No matter the role I'm interviewing someone for, the very first question I ask them is always, tell me what you know about OCI. And if their answer is, oh, not much, that is automatically a disqualifier in my book because you've got to at least do your homework on the way in the door. So that's, you know, do, do your homework about yourself. Show up prepared to, to sell yourself, but also do your homework so you understand the, the, the niches that you're sort of selling into. Does that yeah. answer your question? Yeah, okay. What else? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I have two thoughts. Number one, I think a lot of people would steer you toward HR, and I would absolutely not recommend that. Not HR. Um, I, I'm, you know, HR is fine. I don't mean to crap on HR professionals. They're very important, but um, they're not there. Often people go into that field and they, they don't actually realize what that field is there to do. In my experience, HR is there to reduce risk. <laughs> um, they're not there to help people shed limiting growth, limiting beliefs, or any of that, those kinds of things. So where I would steer you, if I were in charge of your boat, I would steer you toward user research getting people hands-on with products, helping them, uh, watching them use them, watching them uh, struggle, uh, you know, prompting them and seeing where that leads, and then synthesizing all of that back to your development team to help them make a better product. That would be my, you know, that's where I would go if I were coming from that background. And then, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is actually consulting on software for psychologists, right? There's all this, um, there's all this stuff right now about uh, online therapy and, you know, all these, uh, all these ways that we're kind of bringing mental health care to uh, a broader audience by delivering it in ways, in new, new ways. So getting involved in a company that is doing that kind of work would also be a place where those, those skills and um, uh, passions would really serve you well. That that's, would be my, my thought. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay, so yeah, so the, 
let me, okay, let me, let me back up um, one. So after saying not HR, the one part of HR where, you know, you might, you know, find a, a good home would be in any diversity and inclusion uh, initiatives that the HR company might have. Um, big companies tend to have this. Smaller companies absolutely do not. So you might need to become a team of one who is helping people uh, you know, do the kinds of exercises I talked about. Take some of those tests, talk about them, you know, ha do some team analysis. Sometimes people don't even know that we become, you know, think about it. We walk into our homes and we, you know, we have a picture hanging on the wall and eventually it's invisible, right? We don't even see it anymore. Uh, teams are a lot like that. We don't know when we're, you know, surrounded by, or when we have a blind spot, right? That's why they're called blind spots. So, um, helping people see them, reminding people, modeling the kind of behavior, that's all, you know, really valuable. So um, it depends on the phase of the company, but in a large corporate environment, D&I teams are doing like uh, things like um, bias training, you know, anti-bias training, uh, and they're doing analyses of teams. They're building dashboards that lets a leader see what the, what the actual makeup of their team is as opposed to just what they think it is, because often the, the numbers and the reality are quite different. So, does that answer your question? Cool. We have time for one more question. Okay, one more question. Yes. Um, you said you took some time off to raise children. I, I know, I did not take any time off. That? No, I freelanced. Oh, so I worked full time, but I, I did it on my own terms so that I could, sure. yeah. The question would have been, what are some of the challenges you faced getting back into I never left. <laughs> I was unemployed seven days, that the time when Nebula died, that was it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it turned out getting back was pretty easy at that point, so. <laughs> oh, can we do one more, Rebecca? There's someone right behind you. Yes. Um, I have a question. Yes. So, as a non-technical major um, at a tech company in yeah. the tech world, have you ever had to, like, try to gain people's respect, in, especially up in upper leadership? Oh, heck yeah all the time, I, do, I have to do that every single day. Um, and that's, that's where I was saying about in a, in a technical knife fight, I bring a banana. I'm not ever gonna win a deep technical argument. But what I am always gonna have done is my homework. I will understand the space very well. I uh, am able to uh, drive clarity. I can take a lot of, you know, there, there's often in, the, in, in organizations that are moving very fast, uh, there is a problem sometimes where people believe they have communicated and they have not, or they've only said it once and the right people didn't hear it, or they said it kind of awkwardly and it didn't hit. So one of my skills uh, in, in my context is simplifying and getting things down, taking all of this chaos and these differing, you know, these, these priorities that might be in conflict with one another or there might just be too many of them, uh, and boiling that down to a very simple message that a team can actually execute on. Uh, I'm very good at hiring. I can pitch. I can go to a person who thinks Oracle is the crappiest company in the world and they never want to work there, and I can get them from that place to this place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know what my free square is. And it's never going to be, you know, uh, data structures or, uh, you know, that it's not about, you know, you need someone to do that, go hire someone else. If you need someone to do the things I can do, I'm your gal, I'll make it, I'll make it happen. So knowing, knowing your skills and being able to really sell them is the key to respect. And it is also the key to um, opportunity because these are problems everybody has. And, and if you're the one to help solve them and you can explain that really well, there's nowhere you can't go. Thank you, Leslie, for coming. My pleasure. <laughs>